Let's start at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. <clears throat> now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. <clears throat> but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? <clears throat> do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was, who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You are bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that that is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. <laughs> That's funny to me. We'll talk about it in a minute. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she has passed her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. <clears throat> but he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So then, both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that last verse is one of the funniest things in the Bible. <clears throat> Just look at this last verse. 
He says, this is my opinion, but I also have the spirit of God. So you just decide for yourself, you know, if it's actually opinion or the truth. It just sounds like something Cliff Briscoe would say to me. <clears throat> He's always making jokes like that. Okay, let's go through this. Did anyone follow any of that? <laughs> Feel like it, what? Well, that's kind of what it sounds like, but we have to consider everything here, and that's what we're going to do. What? What? Oh, yeah, you're too late. He did say, what did he say? Uh, uh, if, you, if you marry, you will have trouble in this life. That's what he says. <laughs> right on. <laughs> okay, let's look at this. He says in verse one, now concerning the things about which you wrote. So what he's referencing here is obviously the Corinthians wrote him a letter and asked him some questions. Okay, probably the ones who were kind of the secret believers of the bunch who were not trying to listen to the false teachers that were there, who were trying to escape that, writing to Paul in secret, asking him questions, how are we supposed to live? Like, tell us how to live right now because we, we want to hear from you. <clears throat> um, so he says, I'm going to start talking. I'm going to start answering some of the questions that you asked me. He says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. <laughs> <laughs> now, apparently, they, what they were asking is because of the immorality that was going on in the church, we talked about this the last couple of weeks. There's immorality going on in the church, sexual immorality. And they're, they're like, well, should we just not even touch a woman then? Like, should we just refrain from touching a woman? That way we just don't do it. And it's really interesting because if you remember in Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent approaches Adam and Eve, and he says, hey, did God really say you can't eat from this tree? And Eve says, yes, he said we can't eat from it or touch it. <clears throat> and so she was like adding something to what God said. And it's probably her, her own mind thinking, if I just don't touch it, then it won't be a temptation for me. I can't even touch it. I'm just going to stay away from it. All right. But God never said don't touch it. He just said don't eat from it. So they're asking Paul, should we just not touch women? Because uh, really when I say touch, I mean the word touch, he's, he's talking about sex, okay? That's what he's saying. Should we just not have sex at all, period? Um, because obviously this is a problem. Now he says, yeah, if that's what it takes, don't do it. Just stop. Just stop having sex, period. But then in verse two, he says, but... Because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. What does he mean by this? He's basically saying, you obviously can't help yourself. You need to get married. <laughs> it's not enough to just say, we're just not gonna have sex anymore. That's not enough because you're obviously out of control. If you're out of control, you need to get married, okay? Each man needs to find a wife. Each woman needs to find a husband if you're just completely out of control. That's why it says, because of immoralities. <clears throat> and then in verse three, he starts to get into, you know, the heading of this chapter for me, it says teaching on marriage. He's really not teaching about marriage. He's actually teaching about sex, really, in, when you really look at everything he's saying here. But in verse three, he says about marriage, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. Duty is like conjugal duty, debt, dues, all right? Specifically, sex. <laughs> it's like if you're married, you guys owe this to each other. If you're married, the husband owes uh, his wife his body, and the wife owes her husband her body. Like it's, it's just part of your dues and your debts to one another. It's not like you're just trying to pay, you know, pay each other with that. I mean, that's just weird to think about it that way. It's just, this is how God has designed it. He's made it so that this um, exchange happens 
And it, it really does pay off a debt in your marriage. It pays off a debt in your marriage. Whenever you don't come together, if you're married, if you don't come together, you begin to feel that debt and that separation in your marriage. And the moment you do come together, that debt is paid, it's fulfilled, and you don't feel separate like you did before. <clears throat> so he says, each the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. And then he goes even further. He says, the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. He's basically saying, husbands, your body belongs to your wife. Wives, your body belongs to your husband, okay? If you're married, it's not yours anymore. It's theirs, Okay, it doesn't mean that you don't take care of your body like it's your own. It doesn't mean that you don't protect your body like it's your own. It also doesn't mean that you just let people throw themselves on you. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. You don't just let your spouse throw themselves on you. It's more like I have to understand that I have committed myself to my spouse to the point that every part of me now belongs to her, just the same way that in, in my relationship with Jesus, every part of me belongs to Jesus. It's the same thing in marriage. Every part of me belongs to my wife. Every part of me belongs to my husband, to my spouse, and that includes my body. <clears throat> in verse five, he says, stop depriving one another. Apparently they were doing that, which is just weird and twisted. Okay, because you're thinking about a husband and a wife depriving one another of sex. So you're literally talking about people who are intentionally saying, no, you can't have this. And, and more than likely, they were using it as leverage in some cases. More than likely, they were using it as bribery to make their spouse do something or to be something. I'm going to deprive you of sex until you do what I want you to do or be who you want me to, or who I want you to be till you change. But he says, stop, stop depriving one another. And then he says, accept by agreement for a time <clears throat> so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. It's like, if you're going to deprive yourselves of, of sex with one another, let it only be because you want to spend some time focusing on Jesus, period. That's it. It's just like when you would fast. Has anybody ever fasted in here? You deprive yourself of food, not because you like being hungry. You deprive yourself of food because whatever you deprive yourself of, you're going to replace with Jesus. You're going to use that as motivation to pursue Jesus on an even greater level. So it's like if you're going to deprive yourself <coughs> of of, of if you're going to deprive your spouse of sex, let it only be so that both of you can really pursue Jesus together in prayer. But then he says, but make sure you come together again. He says, deprive yourselves, if you're going to do it for a time, that actually means briefly, okay? You and your spouse would have to decide what briefly is. <laughs> But he says, if you're going to, do it briefly and come together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He is saying, if you deprive one another, if you're married and you deprive one another of sex and you have no self-control, that leads to things like sexual immorality, like infidelity. I've actually been seeing it a lot um, floating around social media lately and on the internet. Articles that talk about uh, marriages in which the husband and wife, they haven't been intimate as often as they should or at all. And they've started to notice sexual immorality creeping into their marriage. Well, it's because there is, some, there is a need there that does need to be met and does need to be fulfilled. And when it's not, it's going to look outside of your marriage for something if it's not there. So he's saying, because you don't have, but he's specifically talking about people who, who lack self-control. In this case, the Corinthians, they lacked self-control because apparently they were just all crazy about sex. They just, it, just how it was. We've been reading about this for three chapters now. But he's saying, if you're going to do that, make sure you don't do it for very long and you come back together because you lack the self-control necessary to keep you from being immoral. <laughs> so make sure you come back together so you can protect that, <clears throat> all right? So I think it's important, you know, it's important on multiple levels for 
married couples to understand the value that is in sex and the value that is in intimacy with one another, if it starts to uh, become less of a priority, then it just opens the door to other things and you just don't want that to happen. That's why it's so important. Now, <clears throat> he says in verse six, but this I say by way of concession, not of command. I don't know if he's saying that about what he already said or what he's going to say or both, but what he means by this is he says, I'm just giving you some advice. In other words, this isn't like a command from the Lord. You know, this is just my advice. And it's crazy because this is a single man who's given advice on marriage, <laughs> right? Whenever you have a marriage conference or you go to a marriage conference, you don't wanna listen to somebody who's single talking about marriage. And yet Paul did, and we're willing to read this and be like, yeah, that makes sense, okay? <laughs> It's because you don't have to have the experience if you know the truth. And Paul knew the truth. And on top of that, he knew who God was. He, he was very educated, was very studied, and he was a smart guy. And so whenever he says, I'm just giving you advice, it's probably pretty good advice. Now look in verse seven. Now, He's talked about marriage a little bit. Now he's gonna talk about singleness. He says, yet I wish that all men were even as my, I myself am. <clears throat> what does he mean by that? I wish that everybody was single. Now, let's, let's dig into this. He says, however, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. What does he mean by that? I think he's just saying like, <clears throat> if, if that is the walk that God has you on, marriage, that's what God has for you. Like, hold on to it. And he actually goes on to say this many, many times. <clears throat> In other words, he's not condemning of marriage. He's also not promoting singleness. He actually has reason for saying, I wish that everybody was single. Now, whenever he says, I wish that all men or even as I myself am, I, I really firmly believe that he was specifically talking about the Corinthians. He wasn't just saying everybody. I wish the whole world was single. Because of a couple of things. First of all, in Ephesians, Paul talks about marriage like it is the key to the mystery of Jesus. <laughs> like he says, if you wanna know the mystery of Jesus, it's in marriage. So why would he say that in Ephesians and then here say, hey, don't get married? right? Why would he say that in Ephesians? And then here he's like, you know what? Don't get married. Deprive yourself of knowing the mystery of Jesus. How is marriage the mystery of Jesus? Because it's the picture of the body of Christ and Jesus in a relationship. It's the picture of the union that Jesus now shares with his church. It is the only picture that you and I have, the realest picture that you and I have. Even if you're not married, you can look at a marriage and that is supposed to be the loudest gospel message on the earth. It is a perfect picture of the union between Jesus and the church. So I don't believe that Paul is saying, you know, everybody should be single. I think he's specifically talking about the Corinthians because what he really wants to get at is I wish you could be single and not struggle with this stuff. That's, I think that's really what he's saying because of the context. I wish you could just be single and not struggle with sexual immorality. He said, the only reason I'm recommending marriage is because you struggle with sexual, sexual immorality. And I'd much rather you be married if you're going to struggle with that. If you wanna have sex, you need to get married. <laughs> but here he's saying, I wish everybody could be single. And I think it's because I wish you didn't have to get married just to stave off sexual immorality. I wish you could just be single and not have to deal with this stuff. So obviously, according to Paul here anyway, he didn't struggle with that stuff. It wasn't a struggle for him. It may have been at one point, but right here, it obviously wasn't. <clears throat> Everybody with me? Okay, I know this is like really amazing, entertaining stuff here. 
but <laughs> but it's useful, I promise. We'll, we'll see how useful it is here in just a little bit. In verse eight, he says, but I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. I've heard that a lot. It's better to marry than to burn. You gotta be careful with that verse because people use it as an excuse to get married. Well, I really wanna have sex with that person. I should probably marry them. No, that's not what Paul is talking about, okay? He's specifically talking to the Corinthians who, were, who had a major problem here with self-control. <clears throat> so he's saying, if you're unmarried, if you're a widow, just stay single. But if you're burning with passion for somebody, then marry them. Like if you feel like if you don't marry them, you're going to have sex with them tomorrow and it's gonna be outside of marriage, you need to marry them, just do it. But then he's not being so casual about marriage here. He's not saying like, hey, use marriage as like your ticket to, to be intimate with this person, okay? Because he goes in here to talk about the, the, how sacred marriage is. Right after he says it's better to marry than to burn, he says, but to the married, I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord. Everyone say, but the Lord. The reason he's saying this is because this is Jesus. This is something Jesus talked about, okay? He says, to the married, I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. Okay, so why does he bring this up? He's, yeah, he's saying, listen, I know I just said it's better to marry than to burn with passion, but you need to understand that if you get married, you're stuck there. That's why he's saying it. So it's not like I'm saying, hey, marry that person, have sex with them, divorce them, marry another person, have sex with them, divorce them. He wants to make sure that he's covering his bases here. He's saying, listen, it's better to marry than to burn with passion, but if you're gonna get married, you're stuck. You have to understand, you can't just leave. If you're going into that marriage, you can't just divorce them because you decided you wanted to be intimate with somebody else. It doesn't work that way. So that's the real reason he's bringing this up. And then in verse 12, he says, but to the rest, I say, not the Lord. I like that. <clears throat> he said, this is me, not the Lord. Now, it is in the word, so you could argue, obviously, Paul is being inspired by the Holy Spirit. We believe that everything that made it into the word of God is the word of God. It's infallible, all right? But the reason we have to understand that a lot of these were Paul's opinions is because it helps give context to the letter that he's writing and who he's writing it to. And it helps us to understand what we can take from it without just being like, well, Paul said it's better to marry than to burn with passion. I should go marry that person because I really want to be intimate with them. Or later on, he says, it's better not to marry. I guess I should just shouldn't marry. We have to understand everything Paul is saying here, why he's saying it, whether it's just his advice, his opinions, or straight from the mouth of God. It, it all goes together, I promise. <clears throat> so he says in verse 12, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. This is a tough one because I know people who are married, who, who are believers, who are married to unbelievers. And I'm sure that that can be hard because as the only believing spouse in your marriage, you really want your unbelieving spouse to walk with you in your Christian walk. And many times they might just refuse to. You want them to come to church with you, which honestly, we live in a day where we see way too many, and it doesn't just happen with women, but we see way too many women coming to church without their husbands. I mean, married women coming to church without their husbands. Well, their husbands stay home and be lazy or sit around or play video games or whatever it might be. Um, <clears throat> or, but I'm not criticizing the things that they do. I'm just saying like, 
they're, they're not doing anything for their families, staying at home while, they're, while the mom is bringing the kids to church, you know, on a Sunday. I see this all the time. I see it all the time. I have seen dads come to church without their wife while their wife stays home. And that's hard. But the word here, whenever Paul's talking about this, he says, if you're in that kind of marriage where you're believing and they're not, stick with them. And there's a reason he's saying this. First of all, there's the sanctity of marriage, which is just don't, if you can avoid divorce, don't do it. <laughs> like if it's possible to avoid it, then and take that route. But the other thing, he goes in here, right here in verse 14, he says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Now, let me mention this. Whenever Paul was writing this letter, Christianity was fairly new. It wasn't something that had been around for thousands of years like it has for us. It was fairly new. <clears throat> so you would have sometimes married couples where one individual, one spouse, would come to know Jesus before the other one. It wasn't something that they walked together into. Sometimes you'd have a story where one spouse would come to know Jesus before the other one. And Paul is saying, don't leave them. And he says, don't leave them because the unbelieving spouse is sanctified or made holy through their believing spouse. And the children are made holy through their believing parents or believing parent. What he means by that is not that if you have a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse, as long as the believing spouse is going after God, then the whole family is going to heaven. That's not what he means by that. He doesn't mean that, you know, if the wife is believing and the husband is unbelieving, <clears throat> that since the wife is believing, the husband is also a, automatically a believer. No, because the word makes it clear that an individual person has to what in order to be saved? What? Believe. Believe. Yeah, you have to believe, you have to confess, you have to repent. This is all part of the process right here. Every individual has to. So it's not my salvation gets transferred to you whenever we become one, or my salvation gets transferred to my kids magically whenever we you know, have kids. It doesn't work that way. What he's talking about here is that at some point, the believing spouse is going to draw a line in the sand and be like, we're not doing this, or I'm not doing this. I'm not gonna live this way. I'm not gonna walk in sin. I'm not gonna do this. Say that the unbelieving spouse wants to go off and commit a sin. I don't know what it would be, but say they just wanna go off and commit a sin. Well, the believing spouse is gonna say, no, I don't wanna do that. Well, in that case, either the unbelieving spouse is gonna go off and commit a sin by themselves, or the unbelieving spouse is gonna decide not to do it because their believing spouse doesn't want to do it. Are you with me? So in a way then, the believing spouse actually becomes a standard for the family because there is no standard outside of Jesus, okay? So this is what he means by the unbelieving spouse is sanctified or the kids are made holy is because um, kids, if, they're, if they are just kids, they're not just going to go off and commit sins without you. You're their parent, so whatever you're doing, they're gonna do. And if you're living for Christ, they're gonna follow you. Even if they've yet to make the commitment to believe, to receive Jesus, to confess him, they're still gonna follow you. So the way that they're gonna live is holy. The way that they're gonna live is sanctified. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, yeah Joe, you got it, huh? <clears throat> All right, is this... Interesting to you guys, is it? Kimmy, Kimmy thinks it's interesting.
Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I know I know one family in particular where you have one believing spouse and one unbelieving spouse. And over time I've watched this unbelieving spouse start to become more of a believer than they probably even know that they are. <laughs> Uh, even though they continue to refuse, yeah, to, to say that they don't believe. Um, but you're seeing it happen just gradually. And it's because the believing spouse sets a standard in the family, whereas an unbelieving, unbelievers don't have standards. That's the whole point. Like you don't have a standard. You just kind of do whatever you want. But a believer has a standard. So when you have a believing spouse, it sets a standard for the family. And then either the unbelieving spouse has to go or they have to eventually just kind of fall in line and agree to live that way, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of what he's really hitting on here. Now, and he, he says this in verse 15, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. He's basically saying, you're not obligated to, keep, to, to like try to keep them around. If they don't want to stick around, let them leave. Um, he said it's better to have peace in those situations than to try and get them to stay in a situation they don't want to be in because they don't agree with the standards that you've set in your own life. Yeah. <clears throat> and then verse 16, he kind of elaborates on that. Like I said, he's going to start to get to where he's just repeating himself. For how do you know a wife whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know a husband whether you will save your wife? He's basically saying, you're not obligated to keep them around if they're not believing because how do you know if you keep them around they're actually eventually going to believe? Just let them go if they want to go. Right. Now look at verse 17. Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk, and so I direct in all churches. Okay, this is something Paul just said, I teach this in all churches. Now, what he's saying right here is that you might feel inclined whenever you come to know Jesus or you become a believer, you might feel inclined to make some changes in your life as far as well, I'm married to an unbeliever. I should probably divorce them now because I'm a believer. Okay, that's basically what he's talking about here. Uh, well, I'm in, I'm, that, that's the best example I can come up with because that's just really what he's talking about. If, you're, if, you're, if you come to know Jesus, whereas basically he's saying, if, if you have two unbelieving spouses who are married to one another and one of them comes to know Jesus, they shouldn't feel obligated then to divorce their spouse because their spouse is an unbeliever, okay? He's saying, just stay there, stay there. Now, I went to acquire the fire as a teenager, and I, you know, being a parent now, I'm totally against dating, but, <laughs> but whenever I was a teenager, I was all for dating, you know? I was just, I was in support of dating. I heart dating, it's good. Um, <laughs> but I went to acquire the fire as a teenager, and they did this whole message on being committed to God. And it was, it was just kind of weird because at the end, they basically said, if you're going to make this commitment tonight, you need to break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. It's just really weird. 
it, it just felt so twisted and weird. And I mean, you have all these teenagers going up to the front and he's like, you know, are you breaking up with your boyfriend? Are you breaking up with your girlfriend? I mean, honestly, this is what was happening. I was going, this is just the weirdest thing. Like, and, and this is what Paul's saying, like, okay, you've, you've made this commitment to Jesus. It doesn't mean you need to break up with your girlfriend or boyfriend now or stop, you know, divorce your husband or wife now. He actually goes in here to talk about whatever situation you're in when you get married, stay there. And there's a reason for this. He's not saying you need to put yourself through torture. There's a reason for this. Look at verse 18. He says, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. And then he says, circumcision doesn't matter anymore. It's not a requirement anymore. Why is he bringing this up? This is the best example he can come up with, and it is a perfect example. He's saying before, in order to be a believer in that sense, you would have to become circumcised, okay? Now, because of Jesus, circumcision doesn't matter anymore. It's no longer required. So he's saying, let's say you were circumcised and then you became a believer. Well, that doesn't mean you got to get uncircumcised now. That doesn't make sense. Let's say you weren't circumcised before and then you became a believer. Doesn't mean you got to reverse that. Like it just, or you got to become circumcised now. You just, just stay where you're at. <laughs> Whatever situation you're in, whenever you, be, whenever you come to Jesus, just stay there. Well, I got to divorce my husband now. I got to divorce my wife now. They don't believe in Jesus like I do. Got to leave them. Got to start a new life. No. He says in verse 20, each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. The only thing that matters is keeping the commandments of God, obeying God. God doesn't care about where I was when I got saved. He only cares about where I'm going, right? He, I cannot reverse disobedience. I can only move forward in obedience, right? So that's what he's talking about. <clears throat> and then he, goes, he just continues to repeat himself here. Verse 21, were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. <laughs> that's... That's nice to hear, right? Now, I'm gonna burst your bubble here. There were slaves in the early church. It was just how it was, okay? And it wasn't like the picture of slavery that we have today. It wasn't like that. They were slaves, but it wasn't like the picture of slavery that you and I have today. He says, if you were called while you were a slave, in other words, if you came to know Jesus, if you became a believer while you were a slave, do not worry about it. Just stay a slave. Don't, don't try to get out, well, but I'm free in Christ. I can't be a slave. I'm free in Christ, right? I got to force myself out of it. But this is really, he, he does say, if you have an opportunity to become free, then take it. <laughs> but don't like force yourself out of it. But then look at verse 22. He kind of affirms what he's already said. He says, for he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he was called while free is Christ's slave. He's saying, if you came to know Jesus while you were a slave, you're free whether you're a slave or not. You're free, period. Now, I want you to notice something. He's gonna start transitioning his language or changing his language to, to bring their attention onto eternity, onto what really matters. And he's doing it right here. He's starting to do it right here. One of Paul's big uh, mantras is think about eternity. It's something that he brings up a lot in a lot of his letters. And he's starting it right here. He's basically saying, maybe you're a slave on earth, but you're free in Christ. And then he says, maybe you're free on earth, but now you're, you're Christ's slave. <laughs> so what is he saying? He's saying, you need to think about what is beyond where you're at. Maybe where you're at is troublesome for you now that you've become a believer, but what, what is it that really matters? Eternity is what matters. Where you're going is what matters. Who you're serving is what matters. So he's saying if you were a slave when you became a believer, you're free in Christ, so it doesn't matter. If you were free when you became a believer, you're a slave to Christ, so it doesn't matter. He says in 23, you were bought with a price 
with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Now, <clears throat> from here on out, you're gonna start to see what you and I can take from this because I think the first half of this, yeah, we have to consider this is specific in who Paul is writing to. Um, he's trying to make a point to the Corinthians themselves. We can still take plenty from that about marriage, about singleness, about being a widow or a widower. We, we can still take plenty from everything he has already said, but there's even something more of, of greater depth that we're gonna see play out in this next half here. And it's gonna go really quickly because he says the same thing all the time. Verse 24, he says, brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Verbatim, verse 20. I told you he repeated himself. Verse 20, each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Verse 24, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. He liked to repeat himself. Why do you think he repeated himself? It's important. It's important. Now, he's not saying you need to just suffer. That's not what he's saying. That's not the point. He's not saying you need to just suffer in whatever condition you're in. He's saying, get your eyes off of your condition. That's really what he's getting at. Get your eyes off of your condition. Maybe, <clears throat> exactly, maybe you are married to an unbelieving spouse. Get your eyes off your condition. What's God calling you to? What matters is keeping the commandments of God, not trying to reverse your condition, not trying to reverse your situation, right? Now, verse 25, you're gonna think this is out of nowhere, and it kind of is because he's, he's answering questions that they wrote to him. Now, concerning virgins. <laughs> you guys wanted to hear about virgins tonight, huh? I know you did. You came in here wanting to hear about virgins. I have good news for you. Paul is gonna talk about virgins. Verse 25, he says, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I love this. He's, uh, he's saying, you know, this isn't anything that the Lord has said, but you can trust me. You can trust my opinion. <laughs> he's, just, he's just hilarious to me. I really, I really love him. <clears throat> Apparently, they wrote to him and asked about virgins, okay? That's why he's saying this. In verse 26, I think then that it is good, that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. If you're a virgin, stay a virgin. That's what he's saying. If you're a virgin, stay a virgin. Why is he saying that? He says, it's good in view of, of the present distress. This is most likely in reference to the difficulty that the Corinthians and Christians of that day would have living a godly life, especially the Corinthians who were surrounded by so much immorality, all right? <clears throat> so he's saying, if, if you're a virgin, stay a virgin. Keep going. Don't try to change your circumstances. Just, just stay there. In other words, he's saying, I'm not, I know I talked about marriage earlier, don't go get married, okay, just, just stay there and keep going because if you're doing really well, then you're on the right track. He says, are you bound to a wife in verse 27? Do not seek to be released. If you're married, don't try to get divorced. Is he repeating himself? <laughs> are, you re are you released from a wife? Don't seek a wife. Are you single? Have you been divorced? Have, have they left you? Don't go get married. He's repeating himself. In verse 28, but if you marry, you have not sinned. What does he mean by that? He's, he's saying it's just my opinion. It's not a command from the Lord. If you get married, you're not sinning, okay? It's just my opinion. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. <laughs> so I love that he has, no, he has nothing to say about people who choose not to get married. He's, he doesn't say they're gonna have trouble in this life. He, he says, if you marry, you haven't sinned, period. If, if a virgin marries, she has not sinned, but you're gonna have trouble in this life. And I'm trying to spare you. What does he mean by that? Marriage is hard. It's difficult. It's tough. Now, before we get any further, I know we've already read all of this. Why do you think he's bringing this up? 
Why do you think he's emphasizing how difficult marriage is? <clears throat> he's saying, well, he's saying you can't even take care of yourself. Like, let alone your spouse. You're always, you're having trouble taking care of yourself. How are you gonna get married? If you get married, it's gonna be even more difficult. You're having trouble taking care of yourself and pursuing the Lord yourself. When you get married, it's gonna change everything. Now, it doesn't mean don't get married. It's just that you gotta understand where your priorities are at before you get married. So that's why I always say, you know, Paul does say it's better not to marry, but it's in the context of it's better not to marry if you can't make your pursuit about Jesus after you get married. <clears throat> if you're gonna get married and you're gonna forget about Jesus, don't get married. If you can get married and keep your pursuit of Jesus, keep yourself in, in control, keep on um, working toward the fruits of the Spirit, living a holy life, then by all means get married. But if you can't do that, don't get married. So he says, uh, if, you're, if you get married, you're gonna have trouble in this life. I'm trying to spare you. In verse 29 this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened. You think he's talking about, you think he's trying to emphasize this life or eternity? Eternity. He says, the time has been shortened so that from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none. What does he mean by that? You need to be thinking about eternity at every step. Maybe you are married, but you need to be living like you're, like you're not. It doesn't mean go out and be immoral and, you know, find other people to be intimate with. It means that you need to make sure that your pursuit in life is about Jesus. If you're married, you focus on him. Focus on him. Focus on eternity. He brings this up all the time. Think about what is above not what is on earth. Set your mind on things above. This is something he emphasizes all the time. <clears throat> In verse 30, he says, those who weep as though they did not weep. Not that it's wrong to weep, but don't weep for so long that you forget about what matters. <laughs> That's what he means by that. Don't get stuck in your sadness. And then he says, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Now, doesn't Paul say elsewhere, rejoice always? <laughs> he does. And yet now he's saying, and those who rejoice live as though they did not rejoice. What he means here is don't tie your joy to earthly things. Like me, or you're rejoicing for things that have happened or things that you've received on this earth. Don't, don't rejoice always about those things <laughs> because you're not gonna have them forever. And those who buy as though they did not possess. Maybe he's not saying it's not okay to buy stuff. He's saying, sure, buy stuff, but don't get attached to all your possessions because they're not gonna be here forever and you're not gonna have them forever. <clears throat> this kind of thinking's helped me. I, I'm very protective of my things. I take care of my things, but I was raised to, I'm still working on it, <laughs> but I was raised to know people are more important than things uh, for one thing. But above all else, God is more important than anything. If I lose my things, it's okay as long as I still have him. <clears throat> and 31, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it for the form of this world is passing away. He's just emphasizing that point. Everything that is here is eventually going to pass away. <clears throat> when he says those who use the world, it means those who make use of the things in the world and things that matter, like clothing, food, shelter, those things that even Jesus brings up and he says life is more than those things. All right, are you with me? 32, we're almost done because this rest we're gonna speed right through. 32, but I want you to be free from concern one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. In other words, if you're single, the only person that you have to worry about is Jesus. <laughs> That's the only concern that you have. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world and how he may please his wife. Does he say it's wrong to please your spouse? No, he's just saying if you're married, your attention's divided, and it should be. It's just how it's going to be. In pursuit of Jesus, you are also in pursuit of your spouse. 
34, his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Just to repeat, this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. So he's saying, This is my advice. I'm not trying to make you feel bad or make you feel like this is what you have to do. I'm trying to, I'm saying this for your benefit. I just want to help you have undistracted devotion to the Lord because apparently you need help. (laughs) Verse 36, but if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. Uh, We can actually tie 36 through 39 together. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So then both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. He's basically saying through all of this, When it comes to marriage, do what you think is best, but make sure you heed everything I've said up to this point. I want you to to take note of every single thing that I've said about marriage, the sanctity of it, how precious it is, how if you're gonna get married, you're not just gonna divorce willy-nilly like that. Okay, it's not how it works. Um, So if you can't control yourselves, get married. If you can, stay single. All right, he's saying, if you wanna get married, it's up to you, but make sure you pay attention to everything I've said. And then he ends it on one of the best notes anybody has ever ended any letter in the history of letters. He says, but in my opinion, (laughs) every man has to end with his opinion. (laughs) He's gotta get the last word here. You know, yeah, if if you want to give, give your daughter in marriage, If you want to let her get married, go for it. If you want to get married, go for it. But in my opinion, it's probably better if you don't. Now he says, it's just my opinion, but I do have the Holy Spirit. So (laughs) it could be that what I'm saying is not just my opinion, but the Holy Spirit speaking through me. But is everyone clear that, you know, the, the reason he's saying all of these things It's specifically to the Corinthians and what was going on within them. I don't think that it's something universal that applies to every single person on this planet, what Paul's saying. In my opinion, you shouldn't get married. I think he's saying to the Corinthians, in my opinion, you should not get married, (laughs) all right? You should stay single if you can um, because you need to be devoted to the Lord right now because There are plenty of believers on this planet, probably every single person in here, who is more than capable of being fully devoted to the Lord and being married at the same time. You can handle both, all right? If you're single, it's even better. That's all Paul's saying. You don't have to invest in a marriage. You just invest in your own relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. It's very, very balanced if you really pick it apart and pick it clean like that. But we do have to remember it was only Paul's opinion, but he does have the Holy Spirit. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for our study tonight. Thank you that we're, we're past the sex chapters and we can get into the other stuff, Lord, but we thank you that you've put this in here for us. Lord, I pray that each and every person in this house would be focused on eternity, that each of us, even if we're married or single, that we would be focused on our relationship with you, that that would be our top priority, that we would be in full pursuit of you with every step. Lord, teach us how to, how to balance things enough, especially if we are married, so that we can keep you at the top in all things keep you at the forefront of our life in all things. Lord, I thank you for every person in this house. Bless them as we go. Bless all of us as we go. And thank you for keeping us for the rest of the week until we come together on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.